You know, it's interesting when you see the, uh, and I totally appreciate the, uh, the importance of convergence and that word that Lauren and the team regularly uses. When you think about the consumers and what they're actually doing and all the various ways they're now interacting Thank with your you. content um, and the fragmentation of that and what it causes for your business, it's almost like we're going at opposite directions to what the consumers want. The consumers want more and more ways to access the content, more and more distribution points, and you're trying to converge and bring it all together and simplify it on the technology side. And that's such a, such a challenge and very, very much related to that ad blocking discussion. So, um, so we've got four fabulous execs here assembled, um, all from, from DCN, members of DCN, so I'm thrilled about that too. Um, if you don't know DCN, we're about 75 uh, premium publishers, so, um, but these are, these are some of our members. So um, I'm gonna stay out of the way. I do most of my learning in discussions like this. Um, so the, the title of this panel was Taking Control of the Yield Curve. Um, I'm just curious, show of hands, how many people feel like they have control of the yield curve? Well, good, all right, so that's why you're all here. That's the, the white space for Lauren. Um, and so let's start with video, just because I think it's, at least from my perspective, and there's lots of video. Uh, you're all great video companies. Um, and, and kind of unpacking this, this, uh, this challenge of taking control of the yield curve. So I'm struck by in video that, um, at least in the, the research we do across our membership, that 99% of, of video revenue for our members is, is direct. Um, so that seems very unique from, from display and, uh, and mobile. Um, so what are the big problems you're trying to solve in the yield curve as it relates to, to video? And I'll just serve that up as a, as a jump ball. Um, What's like your number one priority right now in, in the yield curve for video? I'll take a stab, I guess. Uh, the, um, you know, the first piece is, is it's sort of a combination, obviously, of yield and inventory management. And it's how much do you inventory do you apportion to each of the associated buckets. So from a retail perspective, what percentage of, you know, if you had 100 impressions, what percentage of those impressions are you going to put in the retail bucket? And what is it you think you're going to sell that CPM at? And what ad products are you going to extend from that? And then as you move down, you hope that the private marketplace is going to develop between the demand side and the supply side so that you can have private marketplace deals and really have more of an equivalent of kind of a digital upfront per se, where you can sell on a private marketplace basis and have higher CPMs, for not, perhaps not as high as you have on a retail basis, but higher than you otherwise would. And then you start moving down into more open programmatic as well as then run of service, where essentially what you're trying to do is make the most out of what you got left, and you're dressing it up with data, you're dressing it up with very other, various other forms of distribution, and you're playing a bit of the programmatic game in terms of how you actually monetize that. But overall, the percentage of impressions that you get in those first two buckets and what CPM you get at it really determine whether you're gonna be a premium publisher and a premium ad sales force or you're not. And then you have to layer on top of that the ad products that you're actually selling as well as, as a publisher, what brands you're selling them with. And if you get too tied up in just selling at a particular CPM because you think you've got a better audience segment than someone else, I sort of compare it now that you're we're all at a stage where people are basically saying my decision scientists and my algorithms are better than your decision scientists and your algorithms, and everybody forgets about the fact that consumers are actually watching content, um, and that matters, and content matters. Um, and if it doesn't, then as a publisher, we're in real trouble. So that, that's my first jump ball. I'll go with that. Um, I'll, I'm going to build. Build. Uh, so <coughs> I, I, I would actually even take it back a step further, which is it's really like it's building blocks for us um, because there's sort of some fundamentals that I think help us to make the most from our inventory. And about four years ago, one of those key fundamentals we came up with was ABC Unified. So for our long form video, we sell it one demo guarantee, one CPM across all platforms because it doesn't matter to the consumer if they're watching a full episode on their iPad or on um, a connected TV or you know, in linear live or in video on demand. Bottom line is it's the same experience for the advertiser and for their consumer. And so we should bring all of that together and re-aggregate our reach as a network. So that was sort of one key model. And it really worked. And it's been embraced because we're making life better for our advertisers as well as simplifying. Well, we've taken the complexity in-house. So we made a simple transaction model and brought a lot of complexity into our house. Related to that, though, at the same time, we always start to think about ourselves as ABC Digital. And I think that that's the way we need to keep thinking about ourselves, which is that as we continue to fragment across platforms, as you know, we have more and more of our 
um, inventory, more so at least than four years ago, is occurring on platforms that we may not own ourselves. A lot of it does, but there's also a lot that happens off. We need to basically make sure that we get the terms or the technology that allow us to treat that inventory no different than the other inventory we represent. So that, think of it as Lego pieces, everything can connect. Your supply is fluid. And when you have fluid supply, you can package it all in very similar ways. A model that works here can work here and work here. And that's what we're really focused on, is making the most of our supply so that we have that flexibility. With that flexibility, I think we're able to maximize our yield curve. Yeah, I guess I would I'd try to build even further and, and, uh, and say that I, I think what we're trying to do with video is trying and hoping that we can reset the market um, and, uh, and, and change some of the fundamental dynamics um, that have been in place now for more than 10 years. Like, very clearly what happened with display, and by the way, those of us who are premium publishers and who have been in the premium publishing space for a long time, we have to take responsibility for the fact that we created this mess, right? Because it was the desire on the part of premium publishers to monetize every piece of inventory that led them to want to want to make unsold and distressed inventory available through third parties. Those third parties became ad networks. Those ad networks gave birth to common pro programmatic, right? So that history really matters because we really set the bar very low and now we've been trying to incrementally over time raise that value and get the associated premium that we always should have gotten but that we, we, that we, we let go, right? So as we, as we reset the table with video, I think what really matters is, is understanding and comparing and contrasting the world of display impressions which really grew up around content and context that matters versus the video which is the content and context at, that matters. And I think that that's not just a subtle distinction. I think it's a really important distinction. And so as we began this journey several years ago, going back now I think about five, we said Let, let's, not, let's not imitate or, or simply extend the existing value proposition of taking networks on a brand by brand basis and making them available as if they were a website or as if they were a dedicated video site. Because then all we're doing is perpetuating an existing consumption and distribution model. Let's step back and say, there's really got to be a way that we can create distinct video propositions, which for us became, you know, what was what, what at the time was the first bilingual video network called Uvideos, where we put all of the on-demand content from across all of our networks in one place, in attempt in an attempt to create a destination that consumers could view as a distinct value proposition in a world that was still principally about on-demand. Right? And the reason that the marketplace grew up on demand was because you didn't have high quality, synchronous HD you know, streaming available you know, ubiquitously, right? Today you do. And so today there really is or shouldn't be any distinction between streaming and downloading, which ultimately allows you to step back from the technology around how you deliver and focus solely on what are the right consumer value propositions that are ultimately going to cut through the clutter, that are ultimately going to deliver value, both content and context, <clears throat> then you can focus on the stuff that really matters, which is how you then go about monetizing those value propositions. But until you've created value propositions that actually matter, the monetization is irrelevant. Uh, got it. Thanks. Um, jump it back to Pooja for one second. So, when you were bringing the platforms together, both linear, digital, and the way you look at the inventory, what were the biggest challenges from a language perspective? Like, talk to me about, like, I, I, it struck me when Emily said that common audience metrics was a really big challenge. Like, from a, the language and semantics and how you talk about the, the product. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a challenge. Um, you know, essentially, we're using either VCE or OCR for those guarantees. Um, so, Nielsen and Comscore allows us to create a degree of currency when we're talking about the offering with the buy side, but there's still gaps. And so, you know, we have unmeasured platforms where we essentially have to take a proxy of, you know, what's a comp on this platform and make an agreement with the advertiser that we can apply that comp to this platform. So, you know, we are, we're bringing it together, but there are still gaps and we're kind of creating hacks that allow us to move forward. 
But I think that the vision is still there, which is that, I think Emily, it was her, one of her second to last slides. It's, it's the idea of it's a common platform, it's a common currency, um, because I think when you do that, we can unlock actually the true value of the proposition that a multi-channel company represents. Yeah, sure. Zach, uh, you know, ESPN, I think, was, it seemed like always to me watching was ahead on that discussion about how you use a common currency yep. across platforms, even into to print, but really TV and digital. How, how has your thinking evolved? In uh, the not dissimilar to Pooja. I mean, last year, Ed Earhart at the, at the upfront started talking about the ESPN impression. And there's a strong feeling at ESPN. And again, it's one of those things, ego or not, we have the luxury of scale on multiple platforms. But it doesn't matter where people are watching or when they're watching. They're just watching ESPN as a product. And as a result, we should create an advertising experience that mirrors that. Um, we shouldn't, and we should encourage the advertising agencies and the clients at large to say, why are you trying to pick off mobile? Why are you trying to create a strategy specifically related to tablet? It doesn't matter. If you want the eyeball, it doesn't matter how they're consuming it, on air or any of the other digital properties we've got. So I think to Pooja's point, there are a lot of gaps in terms of what that economics, what the economics there look like. And I was talking, uh, a bunch of us were talking yesterday, and this is where I think we've got the greatest opportunity as a collective that's in this room, is Facebook and Google eating a huge portion of that pie have done so because they created their own currency. There's no, there's no way around it. They've created their own currency. We have the opportunity to do the same. We're trying to retrofit TV with digital and figure out what it looks like and is it a GRP or is it an impression, right? right? We need to get to a point as an industry because we've got the premium content. Make no mistake, those companies, and I'm not up here to slam them, they're not comp content creators, we are. So I think that we have to take the, the, the onus is on us, and I think Kevin's totally right. We, we, we made our own bed and we're lying in it, and from a display standpoint, we have an opportunity to reverse that quickly with video. Yeah, and you've heard, you've heard me say this in other forums, Jason, <coughs> but the, you know, I, I think one of the greatest disservice you know, that occurred was, I think, the, I think the digital industry, let's go back to sort of the late 90s, mid to late 90s, did itself a huge disservice in setting itself up in opposition with other forms of media. Had the digital economy been from, you know, in those first five years, 95 through 2000, had been focused on digital as accretive to other forms of media, we'd be having a very different conversation today. And, and that then forced about a 10-year debate around things like what, you know, Zach just mentioned and arguments over currency, instead of recognizing at the end of the day you know, the term of art now is total audience. It's been total audience now for about a year and a half. Yet, most of the pieces of the puzzle don't really quite add up to total audience because there are huge chunks of consumption and impressions, quality and non-quality, that are not being captured, measured, reported in any kind of seamless way today. And, and that's where I think there are enormous opportunities. There's been so much focus and debate and angst around the front end, and, and that's where I think there are enormous opportunities, you know, like the company that's, that's hosting this event today, to, uh, to address what fundamentally has to happen, right, which, which is that it is anything close to seamless today to go through the process of someone wanting to make a good decision. So let's assume positive intent. Let's assume someone wants to actually maximize value for a marketer and put together a thoughtful plan that across various forms of media allows you to deliver the right kinds of audiences, targeting, et cetera. Today, that is, that is still from the planning stages to the impression allocation, to the delivery, to the reconciliation, et cetera. Wow, is that hard. And, and it is still vastly driven by you know, human beings with spreadsheets, and it's painful. And so the equivalent of a SaaS solution that allows you to seamlessly go through the value chain that's underlying the ability to then deliver, is one of, you know, you, one of the questions you talked about was like, what are the hurdles? Well, the hurdles are pretty clear, right? The hurdle, part of the hurdles is our own tech stack. Our own tech stack makes it really hard for us to be able to actually deliver and then validate for the, for the marketer what we said we were gonna give them. Got it, but isn't for video, isn't the, the challenge, almost the antithesis of display, where display you're trying to bring in more, you're trying to bring in more demand from multiple partners. From video, you're you're nearly sold out, 
and you're actually finding new sources of inventory through OTT and, a, and other new distribution points? Is that I think, not? I, not I, I disagree. I, I, okay. I think that's a little deceiving. I was asking a question. <laughs> yeah, I, well, no, no, you, I, I, I have a different view. I don't, I don't think that's what it is. I mean, I think, I think um, everyone, should, everyone will speak for themselves. But yes, thankfully, there's still a nice direct business around premium video, thank God, at good, healthy CPMs. But there's no question that the dynamics of common programmatic and pricing pressures and increasingly increasing demands on the part of advertisers and marketers for different forms of, of data verification and different forms of targeting is putting a lot of pressure on the video market just as it has for 10 years on the display market. So I think, I think, it's, I think it's a little bit of a, you just, just gotta be really careful. Um, so I'll leave it to my colleagues. Jeremy, from a tech, Technology perspective and how you're approaching all these new new distribution points platforms yeah. OTT What's the like in 2016? What's your number one priority to try to solve? Um, it's a great question, uh, you know, I think on let me start on the online side and then move to the broadcast side yeah. So, you know as you look you at it over linear and digital right correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, But they're they're definitely related and the conversations, you know in forums like this tend to gravitate primarily to digital but as I tell most of my digital brethren, the, the file and the show came from somewhere. It didn't actually just show up. Um, there are people on the broadcast side that actually make this programming. Um, but the, uh, you know, on, the, on the OTT side, fundamentally, I think you just have to make a choice as to whether that is a hobby or a competency. And you know, we made a decision as a company to go out and, and uh, do some M&A activity. So we bought iStream Planet about six, seven months ago. Um, which is a more modern cloud-based encoding and video delivery system down to the consumer. Um, and they stream, uh, they've streamed the Super Bowls, the Olympics, uh, you know, and they'll certainly be streaming lots of stuff for us. And so once you really decide to make that choice from an underlying technology standpoint, it allows you to build out different types of technology and advertising solutions on direct-to-consumer products or OTT products or all kinds of other things. You, you get to a point where you decide that you're gonna be good at that, right? You don't see Netflix or Hulu or other folks kind of outsourcing that set of capabilities. They insource it because that's what they wanna be good at. On the broadcast side, I've always kind of called this the play out divide um, and play out being sort of, you know, the, the linear network itself coming out of, of satellite or, uh, or out of fiber, out of your master control. And that tech stack fundamentally has never talked to the other tech stack. You know, you've got a satellite distributed linear feed that is getting repackaged and re-encoded and wrapped in IP so that the internet can actually consume that content. The revolution, I personally believe, in advertising is gonna occur on the broadcast side because those tech stacks are now moving to IP. Um, the challenge, I think, for us all is to begin to hook up DMPs into linear playout. If it's not necessarily that you have a different ad per household, but there's no reason you can't understand the audience characteristics of that household and put a particular ad in place in real time on the broadcast side. And so what you're gonna to start to see is, is IP enabled broadcast. So I think Comcast's announcements are prescient in this area. Um, in tech geek circles, they made an announcement, uh, I don't know, three, four months ago, Charters made a similar announcement about rolling out Doxus 3.1. Um, and what that means is, is that bandwidth in the last mile is fundamentally going to change. There's gonna be a lot more of it and it's gonna enable IP delivery of video over either side of the pipe. That's gonna enable all kinds of new advertising models on the broadcast side, as well as obviously those that exist on the digital side. So a lot of these underlying plumbing issues that have existed historically between these two things are beginning to go away and that will take some time but there are lots of companies on the broadcast side that are now virtualizing their services. You see cloud-based playout happening all over the world now. Wouldn't you also argue that there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of human fear uh, uh, around those decisions that happen on the, on the network broadcast and cable side because they've, you know, they've, they've watched what's happened over the arch of, you know, uh, the arc of, you know, 10 plus years in the digital side and, and uh, at the risk of sounding a, like a cynic, which I'm not, um, you know, they kind of look at it and they say, holy crap, you know, we, we, all we've been hearing for 10 years is that the world of traditional broadcast and linear should be more like digital, right? Then they look at digital 
and they look at the, the complexity, the issues, some of which we're not talking about today purposefully, right? Like ad blocking and bots and, you know, last time I checked, bots don't buy anything. Um, and, and they look at that and, and it scares them, right? Because they, I think, it's a, I think it's a great point, but I think, um, you know, the, as long as the pay TV ecosystem continues to exist, which I personally believe it will, it's obviously contracting at some level, but you know, when you read the press, you think it's going to zero and everyone's just gonna watch YouTube. Um, I don't really buy that argument. Um, but as you look at it, those linear feeds may be going through a different technology, but they will continue to be, go through distributors. They're gonna continue to go through Comcast, they're gonna continue to go through Charter and other linear television distributors. And so there's a unique opportunity, I believe, at this particular juncture in terms of future state linear ad technology and partners within the existing ecosystem and distributors to actually build something truly differentiated. Um, and that, that opportunity is beginning now. The, the question is, is whether all the negotiations between programmers and distributors yeah. are gonna prevent that from happening. Yeah. Um, and, and not picking one better than the other. And for a while yeah. there, it looked like, it looked like you know, TV everywhere or, or different forms of authentic, authenticated viewing was gonna be like the answer. And the truth of the matter is that, I think it's disappointing, but the cable industry really, really kind of blew that one, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they had it. Um, it was theirs, and just by virtue of making it too complicated, they couldn't get more than what, Jeremy, 30% adoption or something? In that general neighborhood, right? yeah. Um, so that was a huge missed opportunity, but now that people are doing more and more, I mean, all of the companies represented here are doing more and more direct to consumer uh, offerings, you know, uh, live, linear streaming, et cetera. I, I think that's actually a really good thing because I think that the cable, telco, and satellite industries will then learn a lot. From, from the benefits of asso associated with offering something direct. And I'm, I'm optimistic that, that'll, that that sort of world of authentication will clean itself up. How do you look at, um, how do you look at the competition set and how it's changing? Because um, a lot of what you're talking about is this move to more addressable audience. Um, the MBBDs obviously have a unique strength there. So we go from a world where you've got, you know, Google and Facebook eating up half the revenue and intermediaries eating up a majority of anything that involves programmatic um, to a world where the MPPDs have incredible market power in terms of data. Um, how do you look at the competition set, if anybody wants to comment on that? Because I know you all see them as partners. I'm gonna just take a minute to talk about Google and Facebook. Okay, yeah, go we'll ahead. We'll go there. Um, I, I think that they are definitely competitors. They, they built their business, you know, first by taking share from other media. I think that they've firmly set their sights on the television industry next. Um, but I think that we, we, we need to think carefully and thoughtfully about how we wish to compete with them, and then also about what our message will be. Because we're fundamentally different propositions and companies. You know, they are, they're platform companies, and they're, you know, to, to your point, not content creators. Um, they have a lot of our content, and they want more of it. And they want it because they operate in a very different world. We essentially, especially in the ratings-based world, ratings points are scarce. They're sold out. And in our video world, uh, you know, we've, we've had similar success. We are, you know, I think, generally speaking, premium long-form video, very well sold. Um, they have limitless supply. And so they're willing to do a lot of different things from a transaction standpoint than we are. And when you have limitless supply, you would approach pricing very differently everything is upside on your yield curve. And so for us, we're gonna have to maximize the revenue against each impression, each rating point, and think very, very differently. The other thing that we have to think about and that we're different is they've done a great job of creating their own currency and creating their own narrative, which is that this is where everyone spends all of their time. But that's not actually the case. If you stacked the video minutes by company, you would have to go through probably the networks, cable, and find your way all the way out here before you're gonna get to Google and YouTube. Google, YouTube, and Facebook. And, and that narrative, like we, we as a group of television companies maybe haven't done the best job of making sure that we do an apples to apples comparison because when you do, on things like attention, duration, time spent, we this shine. Is, this is a hugely it's important a huge point, point because yeah. their, their mind share significantly outpaces their actual market share. Right, yeah. and, and in traditional markets, over time, mind share and market share kind of line up with each other. Here, there's been a, a, a very distinct gap for an extended period of time.